This is the Get a Life Podcast. X Cult Conversations. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Get a Life Podcast, X Cult Conversations. Um, we are here today with Carmen and Richard and myself, and we have a special guest, Ross Atmore. Um, Roz, we would love to know where you're from and kind of how you got to where you are right now. I know that you um, tried leaving shortly after you and your husband were separated from the brethren and were unsuccessful at that and then had to wait quite a few years later to try it again. Do you want to fill in the listeners where you're from and how you got to where you are right now? Yeah, good. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Ros Atmore, and I'm from Liverpool in the UK. Um, I originate from Southampton, so I moved to Liverpool when we got married. I married a scouser. Um, he would not like me calling him a scouser, by the way, at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we... I managed to leave the Brethren in November 2018 um, and I didn't, um, I had a lot of help to get there but I managed to do it with my three children and I got up and walked um, away of my own accord. I, um, I didn't need them to shut me up or withdraw from me or any of that. I wanted to leave so I did um and the aim was to go back to being with um my husband who had left in 2015 um in the May 2015 he moved out of the household to into rented accommodation um just because not because he didn't want to be with me and the children but because it was so traumatic and confusing for the children um, because he and for a long time did not want the brethren and hadn't wanted anything to do with them for a while um, and I at that point did and I wanted to live as a good a householder in the brethren and bring the children up doing what was right um we agreed with um i suppose it was elders but they're not really elders they were just the people leaders. yeah brothers or whatever you want to call them um actually mainly bosses of of um the workplace where Russ worked, that he would move out to a local, um, just a, a local house um, so that we, me and the children were still able, we knew where he was and were able to see him. But um, after about three months of living on my own with the children, I decided I didn't want that. And this was back in 2015. And I decided that I wanted to be with Russ. There was no reason why we shouldn't be. And I wanted to leave with him. Um, there was, um, this was agreed with the children. We brought the children into it and told them and they were absolutely made up to think that we, that dad was gonna come back into the household and we were gonna do everything together again. Um, and, the brethren basically stepped in um, and my older brother um, was sort of the instigator of it all really, um, contacted the counsellor I was seeing and got her to declare me as psychotic. Um, I don't know whether she did that because of my behavior because I was pleading with her on the phone to help me because I wanted to leave and be with Russ and um whether she took from my dramatic behavior that that was what I was I was psychotic in her eyes I don't know but um so my brother 
told me that I was mentally unstable and unable to look after the children and I needed a break um, and to come with him um, with the youngest that was then three um, and, and stay with him for the weekend um, and let the others go, the other two. Um, then I think seven and 11, something like that, um, go to their friends' houses and stay just for the weekend. Um, I was determined I wasn't going to the meetings when I was with him. So I literally packed a couple of denim skirts. <laughs> <laughs> the famous dem denim skirts. Yeah. <laughs> and just like, it was October, but it was a fairly warm October. I didn't take a coat with me. I just remember bunging some stuff into a bag and we drove away. Um, literally Russ came home to sort of what's going on and I said oh I'm just going to Ali's for the weekend um we'll be back the kids are going to go to their friends for the weekend and and I'll see you soon um I didn't come home to the house for another four months oh wow um and with that within that first week I was I was put under so much pressure. I had my phone taken away from me um, with, that I could contact him with. Um, I had, there was so much that went on. Um, and I was told that I wouldn't be going home until I was well enough. And that I was, not only was I psychotic, but I was um, medically dependent on alcohol and that I needed to get better. Um, so yeah, one thing led to another. I didn't, the children didn't come back to me or I wasn't able to look after them for another couple of months. And then I moved in with the couple that was looking after them. Um, and we lived with them as a family for another couple of months, um, before they would let me go home. The one thing I will say then was because of the therapy I was doing and the fact that they told me I was dependent on alcohol I started going to AA um, which gave me a big insight into other people's lives and another like it just gave me another stage really setting of what was out there and and um I sort of formed friendships that I you know were just I would never have thought of forming and they insisted the my counsellor insisted that I do a parenting course because everybody decided and thought that I wasn't mm. a strong, I wasn't able to look after my children strong and that, that my children rang rings around me. Um, and they, so I did a parenting course as well. I, in fact, I went on to do another one after. Um, but what these things did was just made me stronger hmm. and just made me more independent and able to see things from different viewpoint and gave me a lot of strategies and, um, yeah, it was it was a strange, traumatic time. And after the first week of leaving um, Russ, I wasn't allowed to speak to him and I never spoke to him again for a whole year. Um, and he, even when he emailed the children and things like that, I mean, it was just dreadful the way we treated him, the way... I was taught to treat him and deal with it. Um, it just fills me with absolute horror that I could have been that person. But yeah. Um, you pleaded with uh, the brethren too, to let hit, let the kids see his father, right? Yeah. After, after a few months, we were having massive reactions from the children. Um, and at first I was thinking, will it add 
to their trauma if I let them see their dad or will it help? And so we introduced it slowly through a counsellor and, um, and the kids were just so made up and so happy and so buzzing with the fact that they were seeing their dad again. Um, it made me question why, you know. Um, but the one thing that behind all of this, um, when I was diagnosed with being psychotic and diagnosed and told I was dependent on alcohol and everything I came off alcohol went on strong antibiotics antidepressants antibiotics <laughs> antidepressants and um I kind of had to learn how to live for me because our marriage had always been really um rocky really turbulent in everything and I never, I never sort of looked at me in everything. It was always, the focus was always on Russ and the, all the kids. Um, and so in all of this, I somehow, I don't know how, but I managed to get my laptop to be, um, to not be connected to the Streamline 3, to the UBT Streamline 3, which is their watchdog. <laughs> and so I don't I don't know how I did it and I don't I think somehow I'd had to get hold of a um a new or I did a reboot or something to to install like a new it might have even been like the window new windows or something anyway <laughs> what, <laughs> Dreamline 3 didn't exist on my computer and I quietly downloaded Netflix and things <laughs> and just, Evenings, smart girl. <laughs> I know. Evenings. I just started watching films, and I was absolutely in trance. And I honestly, honestly mean it. I probably watched a film every night. <laughs> so you think of how much I watched for three years, three hundred and sixty-five days. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably a lot more interesting than the city reading. <laughs> <laughs> did all that from everyone because I was this good girl trying to be the mum of three children and bring them up rightly um once or twice my kids would get the ability to watch things and they and I would let them watch like Disney things but then they'd get on the school bus and start quoting all the lines <laughs> oh that's not good Um, but yeah, as the years went on, Regan was growing up into a young lady who was very, very dependent, um, independent and very strong willed and very strong. I mean, she was outspoken and she just didn't care what she said. <laughs> um, still doesn't. Um, but um, this rubs people up the wrong way. And so she was getting into trouble with school teachers. And um, if she came across um, men that annoyed her, like in the Brethren, she would tell them, she'd just stand up and tell them what she thought of them. <laughs> so tell and, us how old your kids are. How old are your children? <laughs> so yeah. Regan's my eldest, she's 19 now. Um, right. yeah. She was 15 when we left. So and Kyan is 16 he's middle boy and he was 11 or 12 when we left yeah Sheldon is 12 right. and he, 9 10 when we left so no 8 he was 8 that's right yeah. Um, so yeah so she was this 14 year old madam 15 year old <laughs> madam that just <laughs> wasn't gonna be spoken to or told. And um, a bit of my history going back, all my sisters, my dad left the Brethren when I was three. Mm. So I came from a broken household. I came from a household that was split and separated from for years, um, ever since 
they dot. Um, and then as my older sisters, I've got three older sisters, um, reach 16, because they were that much older than me, they remembered dad being at home and knew him. So they all left at 16, sort of 16, 17 age. So when Regan started being outspoken and, um, you know, brothers sort of phoning me up saying this has happened in school and this is what she said and this is what she's done and now this and we take her phone away from her. It just brought everything back to when I was mm. a teenager up with these naughty older sisters. Um, and it just got my back up. And I just literally said to these, I just battered these brothers away and just said, no, sorry, you're not coming to see her. I'll sort it out. Um, and I'd go into her bedroom. <laughs> I just remember sitting down in her bedroom thinking, right, okay, got to have this conversation with Regan. Okay, Regan, did you do this? Yeah, why? <laughs> and I, oh, break it out, Regan, why? And then I'd just end up with the giggles and she'd just sit there laughing with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, this isn't working. She'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, mum, don't worry about it. Um, and one day she just said to me, don't worry about it, it won't be much longer now, because as soon as I'm 16, I'm going to be with dad anyway. Hmm. And it just hit me over the head. I was just like, hold on a minute, no way. No way is this happening again. I am not being my mother. I am not being an assembly widow <laughs> and having children walk out on me one by one. No way. So I said to her, do you really mean that? And she said, yeah, I, uh, there's no way I'm staying. And I was like, because if you mean that, I am seriously thinking that we need to rethink this family. And I want to talk to you all about it. And I sat down with the boys and it literally was days, you know, hours days between the two conversations and I sat down and I said to them look what do you say that I phoned dad up again and see if he would even consider coming back to us and we all try and leave again and these kids just leapt around we were, I remember being in the kitchen and they just leapt up and they were like yes 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 I want to I want to see dad and I was like right okay okay, we've got to sort this, but we've got to do it without anybody knowing this time. We can't go to the school and say, we're leaving. We're going to get hold of dad and speak to him and see if he's even willing to come back. Anyway, the long and short of it was that he was absolutely made up and I did it on, I managed to see him on my own and we met up for about an hour or more. Um, and discussed how we would do it and how I could get them out of the school without mm. them being carted off on me again. Um, because one, the middle child, Kyan, had had behaviour problems and learning problem difficulties all through school. Um, I was in touch with all like the safeguarding team anyway. And I knew the lady was a really strong person. So I said, I'm starting there. I'm going to her and I'm just going to ask her the question. And if I get any form of, right, I need to call people in or anything like that, I'm just going to walk. I'm just going to say, no, forget it. And I just won't send the kids in the next day. But she was absolutely awesome. Um, and to this day, the trustees and the people even the headmistress I don't think knows what was what I said to her and what we discussed in that room she turned the phone off she turned the computer off she unplugged everything she turned she closed the wow. blinds the door, and she said whatever you say to me is in complete confidence and nobody outside of this room has to know and we did it we came up with a plan she she got suspended within a week because she would not tell them um, and she was suspended from her job um, which meant she couldn't work because being safeguarding lead you can't be suspended and 
and keep a job or keep working. Um, and yeah, she um, together somehow um, we managed to get those kids out of school and working with the authorities, with the um, social services, with the welfare, education welfare officers, we had every form of um, protection that we could possibly have, including the police, so that they couldn't touch us. Wow. And it really, it was incredible. And we walked away and we got those kids into the best school in Liverpool. And we, they, the youngest is still in there um literally as in it is the top top school that and you just can't drop into that school at all and it was the one that that my first obviously first choice but never believed it would happen and the safeguarding lead in that school said to me um my mum was from the Plymouth Brethren. She grew up in the Plymouth Brethren. Wow. Wow. It truly, you cannot put into words how many times things like this has happened that you are just given this. Um, it, it literally was incredible. And she said to me, my mum has asked me not to tell you what her name was because she's still scared that they will follow back to her, find out where she is. She never ever wants to see or hear from them ever again. Wow. Wow. She, yeah. You know, it's just, I, I hope this inspires others. Like your whole story. After I talked to her on the phone, I was like, yeah, this is a story that needs to be told because there, how many families get split up when either a uh, a dad leaves or a mom leaves right kids get mm -hmm. kids have to stay back in with the other parent I really hope that this inspires people who are in there that it is possible it's a it's so possible to give your children the freedom that they deserve mm -hmm. like it's just um, incredible kids you have never ever seen such a change in my children the older two fork tooth and nail they'd never got on they just were at each other's throats the whole time and anybody that knows them knew that um and they just the the two of them in their own way adored the baby the youngest one always had done, treated him as though he's their own little baby and they all just adored him he was our little angel that glued us all together but um those two just from the moment we got we left they just got on they changed completely their personas completely changed they wanted to be within each other's company they wanted to do the same things they were happy just being together and getting on um and then when they got to the, the school which was really really traumatic for them from going from a little private church school people that they'd grown up with all their lives to going in like my daughter was 15 16 she was going into year 10 year 11 doing a um GCSEs to a 2,000 strong school mainstream school that spoke in a completely different language just about because they come from Liverpool and are people children are all very very um dubbed down because you don't mix with yeah. um you don't mix with people that speak like that so they had to learn how to navigate this new world with um teenage girls john can you imagine what it was like for regan it was like absolutely such a good job that she was a strong independent character that could fight her own corners because that is what she needed to do 
Mm. And this troubled child that had kicked and screamed and fought and hit and absolute caused murder through school walked into this school and was like a little mouse <laughs> <laughs> he behaved himself like a little angel and went literally up grades like mad his brain was just on it and he was straight oh it was just incredible and and they just grew and they became their own selves mm. and became the kids that they would never ever have become um and yeah little Sheldon was thankfully young enough to be able to just grow his own little way he'd only just left year three which was um year two and gone into year three which was the first year of the peep schooling anyway for that age um so because we left in the November he'd only started in the September and he was out again and back in his own school with his old schoolmates so it really didn't affect him as much mm -hmm, mm -hmm. although I can't say that it never affected him because obviously it was his his entire life as well yeah um, and yeah now he's 12 there's an awful lot of anger that I would never have known was there so when you finally left and got out, how like did the did the priest did they come did they try and get you back once that once you got out or did they just leave you alone? Um, it was quite interesting because we had um, one. I had a few phone calls. I had quite a few phone calls of people saying, and I would just say, I just literally was dead straight with them, saying no absolutely this is it um the reason i'm um leaving is because i want to be with my husband and that's right that's the right thing to do um and the kids need their dad and um i'm not interested in the brethren or what they think the idea of separation is wrong and i'm proving that to you now because this is right this is what we should do and we had a older brother and his wife cool um and they tried to scaremonger me by saying but my wife's sister she went out and she got cancer and she this that and the other and I said all my sisters are out Mr Lunder I said and they've all thrived they've all got happy families and they're all doing very well thank you um probably a lot happier than many of the families in the brethren and not interested not bothered about your scaremongering details um I should be with my husband that's what God ordained that if you get married that and your husband and wife should be together then how can you tell me that we shouldn't you know tell me the reason why we should not be together if we want to be together anyway he was furious by the time he left and our front door was such that it didn't, if you didn't lock it with the key, it didn't stay shut. Um, and plus our next door neighbors were always running through. And I just thought because they were in the house, I'll lock, lock the door anyway. So he went to the front door to go because he was that livid with me and he couldn't open it. <laughs> <laughs> To me. I said, Mr. Lander, you are more than welcome to leave. Please let me open the door and you may leave. <laughs> <laughs> and I gave Mrs. Lander, who was absolutely lovely, gave her a lovely hug and a kiss. And I said, they were welcome to call at any time. Not interested in what they had to say about the brethren, but um, thank you very much for calling. And, was, and she was lovely. She gave me a hug and a kiss and she was... Um, take care of yourself and everything um and if you need anything call us and I was thinking my dear you know they had enough on their plates without me anyway I had then had a phone call from a younger couple who I would say I got on with the wife quite well she's a lovely lovely lady not 
best friends or anything, but I got on with them nicely. And um, they started trying to do the fear mongering by telling me that the schools outside, out of the brethren, were full of bullies. And, you know, he was only talking to a mother who was saying how terrible the schools are because her her friend, her little boy had been bullied and he's exactly the same age as Kyan. And can you imagine Kyan being able to fit in with this big schools um, and all their bullying? So I said, well, um, sorry to say it, but he's been bullied all his life in the Brethren. Yeah. So I think he's probably actually going to get a break. Um, and they were saying, oh, oh, has he really been bullied? I, said, I was like, aunt. I've never, I've literally written letters. I've spoken to teachers. We've spoken to parents. We There's absolutely no way that you, as a trustee of the school, don't know about the bullying that Kyan got. But anyway, yeah, I just fought my corner. And when they were with me, Regan her sort of heard them talking and came into the lounge and just sat right beside me and just sat there looking at them as if to say, you start anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, you know, every, every principal or teacher that's, that has reached out to me since we've made this all public, they say the same thing that the bullying is just ridiculous between the hierarchy in there. And it's funny because on, uh, we're actually going to go in and we're going to do a one school global podcast here soon, very soon. And on one of the recordings we have from their Strive 23, I don't even know who it is, but one of the speakers there is they're, they're implementing an anti-bullying program. And I'm like, yeah, you guys really need that. I mean, more so than you find out here. I did. Well, yeah. One day of the week and this was the day before I pulled the kids out of the school um the one of the parents had obviously picked up on the fact that I was not happy and not coming to the meetings um and said to the kids um that I was um if I ever took my children out of um the brethren that I, I was wicked and would be cast into the lake of fire or something really yeah, like yeah, yeah. Proper, proper <laughs> the lake of fire yeah yeah <laughs> um and so the kids came into the school and of course everything that parents say doesn't matter whether they've said it in the next room if they've been heard or talking about it a tiny little bit of it will come back through the children into the school and it ended up somehow with five or six kids standing around Kyan in the hallway shouting, fire, fire, burn, burn, fire, fire, burn, burn. Oh, that's evil. That's, that's oh. terrible. So. Um, that makes me want to cry. Yeah. Yeah. And this child was just cowering, screaming at them, trying to get away. And the safeguarding lead, lead heard, she came out into the um, hallway and heard it and saw it. And she said, honestly, I don't know how the parents didn't hear in Liverpool and the school was in Stockport, which is a good hour of drive. She said, I have never raised my um, voice to these kids ever before like it. I absolutely yelled at them. She said, I got hold of Kai and dragged him out, told him to go to my room. And she said, every single one of those kids was shouted, told their parents were going to hear about it, that um, this was not going to go unnoticed and that, that they were publicly going to have to apologise to Kai. Um, anyway, these kids, one was the then CEO as such um, son um who didn't really have CEOs but but we did that they were appointed for like the head of the trustee or the leader of yeah. the trustee group and it was his son that was involved as well and when the teacher let these kids go she walked into her office to find Kyan 
cowering behind her chair in a fetal position, curled up, literally just shaking from head to foot. Who is that scared? Wow. And did you ever bring these up with any like priests when, if they ever came to you, did you ever talk to them about it? <coughs> I left it with the school to deal with. Um, yeah. She definitely, and she, and she said she spoke to all the parents. I didn't, I didn't get involved because um, if, <laughs> I mean, fear mainly. Yeah. scared of yeah. you're not fighting one person you're fighting a whole community a yeah. whole room full of them and yeah yeah I want to backtrack just a little bit of something that you said earlier just for our listeners um with some of the stuff that goes on and how they talk about right now and I, it goes into your withdrawn from letter that you got on how they talk to us about how separation is every family's choice, right? It's a choice. It's the choice we make. It's our family's, it's your family's choice, whether or not you want to, you want to stay separated from your loved ones that are out. And yours, yours is a perfect example of how it's such that is so not true. When you're pleading to be, be let your kids have access to their, da- their dad and they're not being allowed to, Right. And if we go into, I'm just going to share your withdrawn from letter on how sneaky they are with, um, with how they word things now. Cause this is, you gotta think this is 2022 now. Can you guys see that? Can you guys see that? Yep. Yeah. It's not, it's not small. Okay. So, so dear Rosalind, we're writing as a matter of respect for your quest not to be visited. Following Lawrence and Ruth's visit and your subsequent message to Ted, we put the situation to the congregation that after several visits and conversations during a long period, coming up to four years without attending the meetings, you have made the decision from your own side to leave the fellowship. It was concluded in the assembly that you are no longer walking with us according to 2 Timothy 2 verse 19. They're, you know famous freaking separation rule whilst we are greatly saddened by your decision we reiterate we would seek to be available and help should there be any change and you seek to find a way back amongst us yours faithfully anthony devonish and gerard clayson like, wonderful right like do you see like they they're very they're very wise to how they word their letters right they took absolutely no ownership at all in anything that you guys went through in that letter. No. Like they're being, I read when, when you said that to me and I read it, I'm like, they're getting really smart. They're getting very smart with how they word their letters. But I mean, yeah. just from you telling your story, you never had, you never had choice. You had no choice to go and let your children see um, their dad. You never had no choice and that you were being overruled. And that's yeah. how it is. And that's what I want our listeners to understand. And For Bruce to understand, he's got to quit saying that because there's so many people that are out here where we are literally, we're living proof that no, nobody does have the choice to stay in touch with their family or for their loved ones that have gone. There's no Mm. choice in the matter. The, the, The argument that me and Russ had when he decided to leave the house, I said to him, I said, um, I can't remember how how it was worded verbatim, but I said to him um, that there's never been any choice. How come that you can just decide that you're going to leave the house, that you're going to live somewhere else? Who who says that that you, you don't have that choice? And he said, of course I do. Of course I have that choice. And I said, I don't have that choice. Yeah. I can't. I can't walk away and and leave this house. And there's never been a choice. When when have you ever? When has there ever been a choice? And he said, "You've always got a choice." But I could not see that choice. I've never ever been told that there was a choice that that one day you could just get up and walk away. I knew and experienced being a choice in the others that have left in my life Mm -hmm. but I never understand how how they had ever made that choice and that's why really it blows my mind to think that I made that choice and I literally just carried it out and walked away 
and that was something. Hope. Yeah, go ahead, Carmen. There was something important she said there too um, about an assembly widow, and for our viewers to understand, um, in Roz's situation, if she had stayed in the meeting with her kids, it would have been made a big deal of, and she would have, you know, been a hero and called an assembly widow, um, because she in their viewpoint, she would have chosen to stay in the meeting when in reality, that's often not the case. Um, and so it's important for people to understand that these women that stay in the meeting are made heroes and they're called assembly widows. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like a badge of honor when in reality, like Ross said, it, it's not really a choice. No. And also in that, in, in, by implication, that the, the partner that's left or the husband that's left the brethren is regarded as dead. It's right. as if he's died. Yeah. So then that, that's how the brethren regard it. That is how my mum and dad were. Uh, to me, I used to tell people when they said, where's your dad? I would, I would literally say as a child growing up, I would say, I don't have one. I don't have a dad. And, uh, you know, the amount of sort of confused looks that people would <laughs> give me. And yeah. that's the only thing that I would be able to tell them, that I didn't have a dad. Um, and my mum was completely the absolute, oh, whatever you want to call them, the Ruths or the Eunices or the whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The badge yeah. of honor, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I absolutely hated it. The fact that she was famous for the sheer fact that she didn't have a husband mm. um, and one by one her children had left. Um, but yeah, and then I became one and I hated it even more. I just, anybody that would say to me, um, you know, you're so strong or you're so you give everybody courage because you always um you're always happy you've always got a smile on your face and be like um well what else am I supposed to do I mean I could walk around miserable as sin but that's not going to achieve much is it yeah. um yeah. you know I oh I just hated it but the 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 thought of staying in the fellowship as well was just these years of what years and years of nothing there was absolutely no way I was ever gonna consider getting married again um I didn't want I didn't really want my kids to grow up and get married in it because what if they ended up in the same situation yeah. it was just do you know what I mean it was just these year endless years of nothing and I was supposed to look forward to entertaining I was doing a part-time job um you know doing all the driving at weekends and you'd get these wives that would come and sit next to you and say oh I've had such a busy day I've done this that and the other and be like yeah I've been in work and got home and got the dinner and got the kids in them car and back out you know hardly had time to do homework get an alarm going off um do you know what I mean it was just ridiculous um and I just hated it absolutely hated it so that's why I turned every single night to a film or yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. did they I'm going to come right out and ask it did they ever did they ever offer you incentives to stay in um well the weirdest thing was just a few months before I left and I knew I think in fact it was the same month as I had made the decision with Russ to leave I used to put all my um expenses in to the charitable um fund thing that they did it's called chart um, and so I was claiming benefits that I could off the government and I was working part time and, and then whatever I wasn't able to meet, the trust would cover it, the charitable giving trust thing. But I had to 
layout and I've got these forms still of every single penny I spent and what I spent it on um and the August before I left I got 10 grand now I hadn't done any different no different expenses to the last two times that I put it in and the first time I was given um like two or three for the next six months and then the next time I was given a little bit more sort of like maybe six not even that much I don't think it was not quite six thousand for the next 10 months and then I was suddenly given 10 grand I was like okay I'll put that in my back pocket that's fine by me but um why yeah it was strange um but whether they were trying to be generous to like make it an incentive for me to stay I don't know I have no clue yeah because you just don't know whether they're listening in on your conversations yeah, exactly right yeah uh, they'd heard I don't know I have no clue I want to share this article that was written um after you left it's quite a funny story behind this <laughs> just see if I can just move this around so you guys can still see so the title is mom of three brainwashed by cult who took her children away um yeah do you want do you want to talk about it about the article uh, yeah so <laughs> it's funny um I'd got to know um John Spinks who had um got in touch with us once we'd left and he was local in Liverpool and um, had left years and years earlier. And when we met him, he'd just written his book and just finished it. And um, he was really intrigued with us because we were this whole family that had just left. And um, so he one day he rang me to say that the guy from the Echo wanted to know about what the Brethren was like these days and how it worked and the ins and outs of it and would I be happy to speak to him so I said absolutely sure no problem I'll speak to him and I'm um, chatting away on this phone call for an hour or so with the reporter the journalist whatever it was and um and he said at the end and he said do you want me to include your names in the article and I said what what article I didn't know it was about an article I said I don't want you to write an article I wasn't I wasn't talking to you about that I'll give you all the information and you can go away and do whatever you want with it but don't include me you know I'd only just left and um so he said oh 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 okay oh fine okay well I'll get back to you anyway didn't hear any more about it fine no problem spoke to Russ and he was like you ought to be careful because Russ is very very that's my ex-husband he was very very wary I mean if you think of the years and years of grilling and interrogations that he'd gone through yeah so he just was not you know he was not interested in anything and he was saying you'd be careful because UBT are huge and they they sue you you're just this little mum on her own and they could kill us all you know sort of thing and I was like okay calm down I'm sure they're not even interested you know anyway Suddenly, Saturday morning, woke up with this ping from the journalist to say, your, your article was in the newspaper today. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, well, this is hilarious because there's not a word of it that's wrong. None of it, every single bit of it is true. There's nothing that I wouldn't take, that I would take back or um, gutted about. It's just the sheer fact. That, I did, that was not the intention at all. And that is the absolute truth. Russ did his absolute nut. He was, he went into, he literally, it triggered him so badly. He was just terrified, absolutely terrified. Wanted to get away as far as possible. Thought that we would have people knocking on the door. They'd be ringing up that they, you know, and, um, nothing happened <laughs> just that was it. it went out and it was a newspaper article so yeah it was just quite funny um but yeah that was it was said 
and done in total naivety. It's a very, it's a very, very good um, article though. I have to, I got to point this out here. Um, Where did it go to? Did you want to read the whole thing out for people who are listening? Oh yeah. There's people listening. Okay. It's, well, it's lengthy. Okay. Well, let's just read it. Um, A mom who was brainwashed by a Liverpool cult claims members monitored her phone and took her children away from her. Rachel, whose name has been changed to protect her identity, claims a brother, Plymouth Brethren Christian Church controlled her life before she finally made the decision to leave in 2018. She spoke out about her family's life inside the evangelical Christian sect after the Echo published a previous article about another man's escape from the group. Rachel claims church leaders even stopped, even stopped her children seeing their father after he left the sect. The Christian group, formerly known as Exclusive Brethren, is an evangelical Christian movement that believes in separating many aspects of daily life from non-believers. Members of the group were only allowed mobile phones provided by the Universal Business Team, a company owned by the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church, with strict restrictions on websites they are able to access. Rachel also claims all communication and website history data is monitored by members of the church. The Brethren did not respond to these specific allegations when approached by the Echo, but strongly refute Rachel's allegations and insist all steps taken to her for her children were all approved. (laughs) (laughs) The church also rejected all claims that they are a cult and have described themselves as a mainstream Christian church whose members, (laughs) sorry, I can't even. We we have to pause a little bit so we can all have a good laugh about that one. (laughs) (laughs) I got I got to get the giggles under control. The church also rejected all claims they are a cult and have described themselves as a mainstream Christian church whose members extensively engage with the wider community on a daily basis. I mean, this is what I wanted to read out. I have never heard such a lie in all of my whole 30 years of being out as that sentence. Exactly. In 2015, when Rachel considered leaving the sect, she claims the brethren had her declared psychotic by a psychiatrist employed by the church and sent her children to live with a host family for four months. Rachel claims church leaders tried to stop her husband, who quit the group in 2015 from having any contact with his three children for three years. She claims her husband was even stopped from going to his own mother's funeral because he had been excommunicated. That's true. Uh, Yeah. And I mean, they do that to a lot of them. Speaking to the Echo, Rachel said, I was born into the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church and moved to Liverpool after meeting my husband at a fellowship meeting. My husband decided to leave the group in 2015 while I decided to stay in with our children. At the time, I was brainwashed and I thought that leaving would cause too much heartache for the children. I consider the group a cult because it is very obviously a brainwashing system where men at the top decided everything. They operated strict systems of punishments and consequences for breaking rules that cause problems for families by causing division and separation. Members of the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church, sorry, I went too far here, practice the doctrine of separation, meaning members separate themselves from non-believers in many aspects of life due to the belief that the world is a place of wickedness. Rachel revealed that if a member of the sect wants a mobile phone, they must purchase one from the Universal Business Team, a company owned by the Plymouth Brethren. She claims that all phones are fitted with software that only allows restricted access to the internet called Streamline 3, and that communication of the members is monitored by the Brethren. Rachel told the Echo the software stops you from going on certain websites. They would know if you got the software removed somehow, and UBT would inform the local Brethren. She claims members of the group would have no would have to request access to specific websites before being allowed access. She added, I remember once my husband sent a text from his mobile to the home phone. All it said was hi. That evening we received a visit from a local brother saying he was here because of my husband had sent a text. We would frequently be made to attend evening talks where we'd be briefed on the views of Bruce Hales, the current leader of the church on the latest technology. Rachel also revealed the damaging impact that it had on her family, causing them to become separated after her husband decided to leave the church in 2015. She claims she was advised by the church not to allow her husband to see his children, and she alleges all phone calls he had with the children were monitored. Speaking to the Echo, she said the most traumatic thing is that the brethren make out that when you want to quit or if you're feeling uncomfortable about something, they tell you that you're ill or mental and not capable of making decisions. They make you feel inadequate to the extent that you just give in and let them take over and do it all. 
My husband kept asking to see the children and I was advised that I couldn't even tell him how they were or anything about them. And that if he was to see them, there would have to be a child counselor present. She claimed when I tried to leave, they told me I was psychotic and took my children away for four months. She alleges that a psychiatrist employed by the brethren declared her psychotic and recommended a short term stay with family members while the children were housed with another brethren family nearly 30 miles away while her phone was taken away from her. She said, when my husband left the brethren and I thought about leaving to be with him, they said, I can't live on my own. They made me think I was mentally ill. They took my phone away and gave me a new one, which was completely restricted with no access to the inter internet and all the records were monitored. Looking back on it, I feel like I was being controlled. The local brethren decided that my children should be looked after by another brethren couple who said they would love to take my kids on. Rachel claimed she did not see her children for two months until she was allowed to join them with their host family. She said, looking back on it, it was completely bizarre. I remember thinking these are my kids, yet I wasn't even allowed to stay the night with them. I went back to my house one night after staying at my brother's and I felt so alone without my children and my husband. I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't have a life. At that point, I had no relationship with my kids. I had no relationship with my kids and no relationship with my husband. It was completely surreal. The experience has had a real impact on the kids because they became so used to just doing what they were told at school and by the church. They don't know how to run their own lives. In the brethren, if you were a girl in your teens, you'd be thinking about getting married in the next few years, and you can't begin to think about your career until you're married. This is not the first account from a former member of the Plymouth Brethren in Liverpool revealed by the Echo. And then it goes into John Spinks. Yeah. Oh, that's really well written, isn't it? It's it was very, very, very well written. written. Yeah. 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 It was a really well written article. And, you know, I mean, we know from Lane Admiral's. Um, podcast with on James D. Fiore's Black Bald, um, where in his story, the same thing, he was always told he was mental. He was always told he was mental, you know? So this psychiatrist that was employed by the brethren, did this psychiatrist, do you know, had, had this psychiatrist seen other brethren members too? Yes. Um, yes. She was very, very famous in her day. Um, and she could charge what she wanted she knew that she would have more many many more people passed on to her um she knew that she had a niche in, in the market where we were she was a yeah um a, a lovely person in fact i've spoken to her since i left because i said and i, and I called her out and I said i thought you would have supported me i thought you would have been to say but she had seen the trauma and the struggles that we had had in the marriage. So she knew far more detail than most, mm -hmm. of, you know, how incompatible we were together. Um, so, you know, it didn't matter how much we loved each other. She knew that it wasn't going to work. Mm -hmm. um, so for me to be to turn around and say to her I wanted to go back to him um, and be with him to, for a counsellor I presume she thought that I'd just gone crazy um, but yeah she knew also that she if she said to me oh yeah go for it she'd lose all her custom in the brethren because yep. yeah. yeah and she would be fired just like the you know, the lady that helped you leave from the school, right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think this is, I just wish there was a way, I wish there was a way that these teachers and principals and people that the safeguarding that are in, that, that have been let go due to, to, to trying to protect children would find the courage to come forward and really start exposing what really happens inside the schools. Because mm -hmm. from the stories that have landed on my lap, they're just horrendous, absolutely horrendous. And I guarantee you, my children never went through any of this kind of stuff in, in the school systems that they went to went through. Not, I mean, you could go and approach it to be taken care of. And from what it sounds like in a lot of these situations, they're not taken care of, right? They, yeah. they get shoved underneath the carpet. And I mean, Carmen, Richard and I are really looking forward to our, we're really, really looking forward to our podcast we're going to do on the One School Global because some of the stuff we're going to go through is, yeah, it's going to send a little shockwave through their Yeah, because I suppose little... children went through them, through the schools, didn't didn't they? Carmen's, yeah. Carmen's children would have gone through the schools. 
Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I got called to the school because the brethren children were bullying my children so badly in the public school that the principal advised me to pull my kids out of the brethren school. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yep. She said there was nothing she could do because it was obviously all church related and she didn't know what they were picking on the kids for, but obviously what was happening in the church was being discussed at home and the yeah. kids were coming to school and carrying it out just like you spoke of. And so I mean, just, yeah. to, just yeah. to clarify that, Carmen, that is when that was at a time when the brethren's children were going to a public school, but they all went to the same public school in Winnipeg that made some kind of special provision for them. Yes. Yeah. And you were at the time not going to meeting. And so your kids were being No, this bullied. was when we were going to meeting. That's when you were going to meeting, right. Yeah. And your this kids were being This was the bullied. final straw that pulled us out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we pulled them out of a the school that was real close to our house and took them 45 minutes away into a different school. Yeah. So they wouldn't be bullied by other brethren kids at that school. Yeah. Yeah. That's and a you great know, this is where this is this is where <laughs> yep. I think when when they talk about they have no hierarchy in there this is what happens when there is such a hierarchy in there just from what i grew up in right and we went to normal schools but i mean because we were on the bottom of the totem pole the games that were played by the people that were at the top to the people that were at the bottom i mean they're taught this they're taught they see live eat and breathe this every single day with bruce he is at Mm -hmm. the top i mean I've had conversations recently with people that are still in there that are struggling and them saying the same thing as like, you know what? The people with money get away. They can go out and they can do whatever they want and they get away with it. But if they were supposed to go and do it, they wouldn't get away with it. Right. And so Bruce literally breeds this bullion, right? I mean, he's, yeah. he's the top notch bully. Himself. He's the biggest bully. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. the yeah. Biggest bully of them all. And he, it just, yeah. it just slides down the hierarchy system. Right. And so I think it's going to be quite interesting when they're trying to implement this bully program from the stride 23. <laughs> uh, they they could start with the be. trustees, couldn't they? Right. Start exactly. with the trustees. Yeah. 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 But, but, yeah. They don't know how, they don't even know how to behave though, because they're not taught how no. to behave. The people that have got the money and have got the name grow up with the self-righteous I can do and say what I please attitude and it's never ever ever stamped on because that they are the their top of the feed food chain Mm. I mean way back way back when I was I mean this is like 15 years ago my brother was the CEO of the local school in Cambridge and um, a young sister in the school whose father took the lead in his locality and whose grandfather was a leading brother, she wanted to jump a grade. She wanted to jump a whole grade and be in the next level, which was against all the school policy, against one school policy, everything else. So the trustees just said no. And the father, you know, heavy comes and pushes back. No, my daughter should jump up a grade. So they say, no, it's against all the policy. And then dad, damn it, within a week, my, my brother gets a phone call from Australia no, this has to happen. You know, this is so-and-so's daughter. So my, my brother, I mean, my brother was very sort of brainwashed and committed P, but even he was wild because they were just, because he had the connections, he could get the phone call from Australia and that was it. Yeah, just because they were rich and famous. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's a mild example of the kind of stuff that goes on, but yeah. it does show how it operates. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, and it goes back to that whole assembly widow thing. Um, if you were an assembly widow, you automatically hopped to the top of the food chain um, and they <laughs> took special care. And part of it was, I think they took delight in splitting up families mm. um, and saving one in, you know, they treat, they gave them special treats. Like they got to go to way more three day meetings or they got, you know, you were put in a higher in a higher group. Definitely. Well, it was kind of you're a kind of a living example to everyone of how wonderful it was that you actually loved Bruce Hales more than you loved your own husband or your own children. And so that just proved that you were a super special person. Um, I don't know if it was in the days when I was a kid, though, because when I was a kid, we were very, very much bottom of the ladder. Mm. My mum. okay, yeah, she she had this 
um, like sort of um, was thought about as being a really strong person because she, you know, said no to the world so many times. Um, but she, it, we as a family were despised. She couldn't drive because she had an eye condition. Um, so we had to be driven everywhere. And there were six kids. Do you know what I mean? It was wow. like we yeah, absolute yeah. bird. And was that when John Hales was in power or Bruce? Um, it was Mr. Symington to start with and then John Hales, yeah. Yeah, see, I think in the more of the whole assembly widow thing really was up the ladder ranking when Bruce comes came in, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think John Hales or Mr. Simonton would have given it the same kind of credibility as what Bruce is doing. I mean, Bruce knows what he's, Bruce, Bruce is very well aware of what he's doing. He knows, he knows how to schmooze the women and be able to get what he needs. Yeah. My mom, just out of interest, my mom has literally, I think it's a little bit of fixed thinking with her. She can't think another way she just can't she will never ever ever see um it but she was only married a week when 1970 happened Aberdeen mm -hmm. um, and her parents and all her siblings left she was married one week and she went to my parents house the day that 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 the story was told if you know what I mean revealed and my grandpa her dad pleaded with her to believe him that um, Mr. Jim was wicked and she would have none of it. She walked out the door and she never ever spoke to him or saw him again. So she has literally turned her back and said, like chosen the fellowship over four generations on her parents and her siblings who still love her. And I've met them all now. So my grandma is still alive at 102. Wow. <laughs> incredible, awesome lady. And um, then her husband, 13 years married, she said, no, um, if he, it took him a year to leave. He literally was absolutely desperate for her to come with him and to, for not to leave us kids. Um, and then one by one, all her family, she's just got one son left and now her grandkids as well. She, she hasn't spoken to them, phoned them or. Wow. That's me. My kids. Terrible. Are, it's just, it's just absolutely it's so sad that she can still think. And she, to her, she says, you left me. Yeah. yeah. I've said to her many times no I never left you mum never and I still haven't and never will hmm. you know it I had that same reaction so when I was going through my heart transplant with uh, my husband had a heart transplant and we were going through that and um, I was having conversations with my my parents and it was I was I needed I needed my parents here I really needed the help and I needed my parents here which of course obviously they couldn't do and I ended up I ended up writing them a really long letter and just kind of cut things off with them. And I said, like these two worlds for my own mental health, I had to, I had to let them go. I was like, there was no way I was dealing, calling her and informing her. And it was, she'd end up crying and um, wishing that she could be here, which in my case, which just made it harder for me because I needed her here, but she couldn't be here. And so I wrote this really long letter and I just said, "Our, we can't do this anymore. Not for your health and for my mental health. Like, this you got to be all in or you're all out right mm. and the response that she gave my siblings was that I wrote her off that I wrote them off and I'm like how like I never got a response back from it not a like you know what Cheryl you know thank you thank you for that email and um you know I hope everything goes I never got anything back from her oh it was like the worst kick in the gut and then I heard later that she told all my siblings that I wrote them off and I was like where's your fight as a freaking mother where is your fight she should have yeah. turned back around gone to the leaders and said to them and said you know what this is cheryl needs us she needs us in red deer she needs us while she's yeah. going through this with her husband i mean it was how many years of this that we were that i was i was just i was graded down to nothing 
And I didn't have it in my mental capacity anymore to be able to talk to her on the phone. And you know how they talk. They just guilt trip you, right? Yeah. It's the tiniest little things that they guilt trip you over. And I didn't have space for it. I was trying to fight for my own husband's health inside a system that has a ton of holes in it. And so I, it is, they have this mentality that it's our choice. No, it's not our choice. It is not our choice. It is, you need to learn how to fight. And I mean, in this case, this is my mother. She should have learned how to fight for me from the time I was two, you know? So I do, I I get what you say when you're talking that it's, they do, they make it, they make it all about it. Well, it's their choice. Mm. Yeah. And just to kind of put that in context for people who, you know, haven't been in the brethren, none of us chose to join the brethren. No. We were all born in there and 99% of members are born into there. So there was never a point at which we said, oh, yes, I'm going to join up to a wacky cult and give away all my rights and responsibilities. <laughs> we didn't have a choice to join. And, oh. and we, we don't have a choice to leave because, yes, you can walk out. But if you do, you're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your parents. You're going to lose your children. And anyone who decides to go with you, they're going to treat them the same way. This is this yeah. is the issue. Yeah. Yeah. And it normally comes down, and I'm sure you can agree with this, Roz, is that it comes down to this life or death situation where you just, you can't breathe anymore in there and you have no choice but to pack your bags and leave. Yeah. yeah. The suffocation, the suppression, the, it was, I was killing myself with depression. Yeah. Mm. I was literally so clinically depressed. And since I've come out, I am not on any more, any, um, form of drug to to make myself better i am literally i i I've, so many people have said you look 10 years younger because yep. i'm just so grateful to be alive and every yep. single day is something new there's something to look forward to there's there's mm-hmm. so much going on and the the one thing that i was told so many times I mean like not told exactly in the words but basically made to feel a fairly useless mum um like you know I wasn't a good example to my children I wasn't um strong I wasn't this and you know what my kids adore me Mm -hmm. there's that every single each and every single one of them love me and there's no doubt that you know I've done the best thing for them and they thank me all the time the fact yeah. that we we're exactly. free you gifted them the freedom you gave them mm-hmm. life and I mean that's what makes it so much better is when you do get out here you do you experience life yeah mm-hmm. yeah well I must say it's hard to believe you've got an 18 year old daughter because you look about 25 I me, know but... you know <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny and very soon <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, is there anything that you want to add Roz that you feel you missed or um no not really but I was quite encouraged or like I was really um chuffed to hear that these podcasts get listened to in there mm-hmm. very much and- so they get listened to in there yeah and I would like to say to anybody that is in my position that has got um, an inkling that what is going on in there isn't right and they want to get out, just do it. You will not believe how easy it is to walk away and how much backing and how much um, support that you will get. Just tell the truth. Tell the go to authorities, go to people that will have your back because they will look after you and, and doors open that you would not believe. Yeah. And yeah. it, it is an incredible thing. Yeah. yeah. It, it is true. There's like this kind of magical thing that starts to happen. As soon as you decide you're doing it, it's like all these doors, they do, they just happen. I mean, yeah. it's exactly how we got our apartment. We had the librarian help um, my girlfriend and I leave like it's it's amazing how everything kind of just unfolds right and it's like it's like I mean they tell you that 
that the Lord will, you know, my mum said some terrible things to me. Um, and they do, they, they instill this fear into you and they, you think that the Lord is just going to block your path every single way. No, he doesn't. He opens it up because yeah. he that they're a bunch of wicked arseholes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Did he actually use those specific words, Roz? <laughs> I love it. I'm sure he did. <laughs> I can assure you. <laughs> but it is, it's much easier than what, it's much easier than the fear you feel. That's the thing yeah. is the fear is much heavier and louder than what the task really is in front of you. Yeah. 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 I had this saying at my front doorstep that says everything you want is on the other side of your fear. And it is, that is, that is it. It's just, it's just the fears. That's why they indoctrinate them so intensely in there with the fear is because it's, it's the fear that holds everybody back. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much, my dear, for coming on and no. blessing us with your story. Um, I will Thank you personally, though, and for many people, I'm sure, but you have like broken the chain. You've broken out and it's and what you've done is is causing this ripple effect to the rest of us. And I'm just in I'm so I so admire you and I literally am so, so pleased and so motivated to to get on with this. And we'll. I just want to smash. The oh, you know what, girl, you, you know, you're in our corner. I was like, after I got off the phone with you, I think, I don't know if I phoned or said on our group chat, oh, we got another feisty one. Like, yeah. and that's what I love about you is you're so ambitious and feisty and passionate. And that's what we need. That's what we need. We need people that have burst through that fear and realize, no, this is the landing pad is out here. And how do we create that landing pad? Yeah. So, you know, we'll be in contact and we have, we have so much, we have so much going on in 2023 that we're planning on doing that. We, we do, we need everyone's help. So yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I know you'll, you'll be on our team for sure. Um, definitely. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Rose or Roz. I keep on calling you Rose. Roz for coming on and letting us know everything and we will chat with you later right Bye. to share your story or be a guest on the show email info dot get a life at proton.me dot